go ahead and get started. If you'll please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's um, meeting of the Transportation Licensing Commission. We scheduled a, a special meeting uh, apart from our normal monthly meeting in order to have a work session. Um, the work session is being called for the purpose of enabling the commission to receive information and legal advice regarding the MTLC rulemaking process to facilitate the drafting of its regulations to expand upon Chapter 6.77 of the Metro Code. Uh, it's important to note that no vote will be taken today or any decisions made at today's meeting. We will have a public hearing later this month regarding the matter. Mr. Fields, I'll open it with you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, at your last meeting, you discussed, you discussed the whole idea of being able to uh, uh, understand what, how you would go forward with rules and regulations. What we had uh, done is uh, we provide you a copy of the ordinance, uh, although it's not codified yet by, you know, through the normal process. We've got the ordinance uh, that the council has passed. We also went ahead and pulled out, uh, we went through and pulled out the, the decision points that we think you need to consider. Um, there, that it, you're not limited to these other than what would constrain you from passing if, if there's a legal limitation as in terms of you, beyond your authority to make, but we believe there are some things that you need to consider. Um, and that's what that list is. So I'll look back to Ms. Castonis if she wants to go through them or if she wants me to or what she'd like to do. Fine. <laughs> Do you mind getting started? I'm trying to look up the answer oh, okay. to your question. We've, if, again, as you go through, what the council has done is passed back, giving you certain, uh, certain uh, assignments as a commission to look at. We'll start at 6.77030, says that you may consider the criteria adopted uh, uh, by the MTLC in, in the way you make your rules for permitting. So in other words, it's saying you should make, uh, you, you may make additional uh, decisions based on uh, what you think is appropriate in making decisions. And this is specifically related to uh, issuing certificates or additional permits. Uh, so you're, you're already in that particular section says in making the above findings, the MTLC shall at a minimum take into consideration the number of entertainment transportation vehicles already in operation, whether existing service is adequate to meet the public need, the character, the experience, financial condition, and responsibility of the applicant, and such criteria as may be adopted by the MTLC in its rules. So you, you have got some specifics that you're, you're instructed to use. If there are additional criteria that you'd like to, to do at your meeting, uh, again, unless you call an, a, another special meeting, at your meeting on uh, April the 28th, if you think there are additional criteria that you'd like to have to review in making decisions, that would be at the appropriate time. Uh, 6.77040 oh, 6 oh, talks about an application fee. The amount of an application fee shall be established by the MTLC based on the cost of processing the application. As you know, we can uh, we can uh, have a we can have a fee structure. The fee structure should reflect the amount of money, not just your staff, but the government in general would have to spend to uh, to review an application. Um, 6.77040 oh, um, and this is under uh, this is under the section uh, that we just talked about. Um, I'm sorry. That is that that is just what we we did. Just I apologize for that. Uh, 050 deals with uh, the commission may adopt additional criteria for determining the necessity of additional entertainment transportation vehicle certificates. That's actually for a future meeting. So I'm not sure you actually have to make. Uh, a decision on that, but the way that I've read it anyway uh, is after this meeting, uh, whenever you make your decision, that will be a rule that you could you would take up in the future. Uh, 
in that same section, 050E, the Transportation Licensing Commission will set a fee to be charged for the issuance of each approved entertainment uh, transportation vehicle permit associated with a certificate. There shall be a separate fee for the company or certificate holder uh, and additional separate permit fees for the vehicle. So what that means is when you approve them, uh, if, if you approve one, you're, you're going to be able to establish a fee for that company as well as for each vehicle that they have permitted. Uh, 6.77060 is in reference to annual renewal. A renewal fee for each approved certificate and other licensing fees shall be charged at the annual renewal of the certificate. So assuming that uh, in, in reading that, they're anticipating that you would do this on an annual basis. They didn't order you to do it annually. That's a, a rule that we're going to be making suggestions on. But assuming you have an annual meeting, you we will you will be able to assess, uh, allow the staff to assess a fee for them to apply. Uh, if they're existing certificate holders. Um, Mr. Fields, we'd yes. asked our last meeting for an analysis of the fee structure that your office was proposing. Has, has there been any work completed yeah, there? The, the work has been, it is being done. We're doing one final check on it, but we're going to be able to give you, uh, a, you know, I mean, I can tell you in round numbers, we believe it's going to be, uh, if you have, uh, say two staff members is about $150,000. Now that is our expenses, what has not been attached. Are there other government fees that should be assessed as well? Uh, but in terms of, of, of an NDOT cost, we, that's, that's what we have, uh, we're actually working off what we had done for the SUMDs year before last. So we've come back and tried to update that, see if there's been any changes. Thank so you. we will have that available to you. Um, then in uh, point six seven seven point zero seven zero is insurance requirements. You're going to be required to set two insurance levels. One will be you will establish holders of a certificate of public convenience and necessity shall maintain commercial general in parentheses public liability insurance inclusive of, inclusive of contractual liability and a minimum amount as determined by the MTLC in in consultation with the Metropolitan Government Insurance and Claims Manager. Uh, and it's written on a single incident uh, occurrence. This insurance shall be issued by an insurance company qualified to do business in Tennessee and naming the Metropolitan Government as additional insured. The second one you're going to be doing, such holders shall also maintain commercial auto liability insurance that will afford the protection to a third party sustaining injury or damage as a result of negligent operation of an entertainment, transportation, or other motor vehicle affiliated with the company in a minimum amount and under such coverage as determined by the MTLC also in consultation with the Metropolitan Government Insurance and Claims Manager, uh, and, all, and it goes on. But that's the primary thing. Under 080, uh, you will be, it, this is dealing with requests for additional vehicle permits and would not necessarily apply to your first time around. An application for additional entertainment transportation vehicle permits under the certificate issued uh, must be filed with MTLC director. If approved, the established uh, permit fee shall be applied. Um, we move to 6.77130. This is under the driver section in Article 2 of 6.77. This is reference to fingerprint background uh, investigations. All applicants for an entertainment transportation vehicle driver's permit must undergo a fingerprint fingerprint based identification and background check. The MTLC staff shall collect background check fees from the application and schedule them for fingerprinting. So you'll be asked to set a fingerprint fee. And the good news is you've set that for the, the council has set it previously and y'all have adopted that. So we have that one pretty well done. Um, and um, in 6.77, um, uh, 180, it talks about uh, each, each entertainment transportation vehicle shall be issued for, shall be issued a certificate for one year. And B part of that is the permit may be issued to qualified applicants upon the payment of the fee established by the MTLC plus cost of the investigation. Uh, that's where you actually will set the driver fee. Uh, if the permit, and when it goes on, says what would happen, but, the, but that would be a fee that you have to set. Um, the next section would be 6.77230. Uh, um, that is in reference to the driver's appearance. It says the MTLC shall have the authority to adopt rules specifically governing the types and permitted or prohibited attire. Previous to that, it says every entertainment transportation driver while on duty shall be dressed in compliance with the rules adopted by the commission, and but they must, at a minimum, have a uniform attire with the entertainment transportation vehicle company's name and logo. Um, 
6.77.290, the vehicle to display identification. All entertainment transportation vehicles operated under the authority of this chapter shall be equipped with identification as prescribed by the MTLC and its rules and regulations. Uh, that's simply what, what is the manner in which we will be able to identify the vehicles on the streets. So we will, uh, we've, we've got a couple of different ideas, but I, I, again, it's, we will be making recommendations. Um, under um, 6.77300, this is talking about safety standards. Um, to the fullest extent permitted by Tennessee and federal law, every vehicle operating under this chapter shall undergo an annual detailed mechanical inspection conducted by a mechanic as reasonably approved by the MTLC director uh, and pursuant to the requirement of rules and regulations adopted by the MTLC. Um, so we will, we will be making recommendations on where would they be inspected. That's been, in, considering some of the vehicles that I anticipate applying, it's interesting trying to find ways that they can get a mechanical inspection as we do for the ASE inspections we do for taxi cabs or, or those sort of things. Under section F of that same uh, section of uh, 300, the MTLC uh, may by rule establish additional inspection requirements for entertainment, transportation vehicles, and other equipment used in the entertainment transportation vehicle service. Uh, and G that follows, the MTLC shall have the authority to promulgate rules, regulations, consistent and applicable laws to ensure the safe operation of entertainment transportation vehicles. Uh, finishing in then the next chap, the next section is 6.77320, operating area. The entertainment transportation vehicle shall operate upon the streets within the metropolitan area of uh, on routes or zones within hours of operations established by the MTLC or its staff. Any deviation from these approved rules, zones, hours of operation, except for deviation uh, caused by traffic accidents must be approved by the MTLC or its director. Uh, and if there are any deviations yet, they have to be uh, reported. So, but anyway, the, the long and short of that is you have, uh, you, you shall establish either routes or zones and hours of operation. Um, six po I'm sorry. It does. I, I generally, um, I, I would certainly, the commission outranks me. So <laughs> therefore I would give, I would obviously put that as an opportunity for the commission. If the commission would like staff to uh, do that, we certainly, uh, would work with our partners, uh, in and around government to make the termination, but we thought we would, uh, put it there for you as well. Could I, could I? Ask a question, could we ask the staff to make recommendations? And we obviously would have yeah. final. Yeah, and, I, and I guess I should have said start. We intend to make recommendations on all these. Okay. We, we, we have, we've drafted and drafted uh, new information. And as amazing as it is, as long as it's been going on, I'm amazed at new information that keeps popping up. So we're, we're going to have to, we're going to get to a, a, a stopping spot where we say we're done. This is all we've got. And, and give you our best uh, recommendations, and that's going to it's going to be based on conversation with police, planning, NDOT, other governmental agencies, as well as meetings with the industry, both supporters and non-supporters that we've had uh, in public meetings and in uh, meetings where they grab me on a street corner and say, "Hey, what about this?" So we're we're going to do our best to share whatever information we have. Uh, as emails come in, we're going to be sharing those with you. I, that'll be, before the meeting's over, I'd like to know how you'd like, if you want them as they come in or if you want them in a, in, in whole. Okay. So there will be proposed rules that'll be posted and people can respond to those. Yep. Yeah. That would, they, again, there are the staff recommendations that, you know, part of what I hope we come away with is after you, you know, now that you're, as we're sharing the things that you have to do, are there other things you want staff to be able to, are there other issues you want staff to explore and make recommendations? And you don't have to have a recommendation. Obviously the commission makes the, the rules. We can make the recommendation, but the commission has the, it's your, it's your responsibility. So we're, we want to share with you and work with you any way we can to provide it. Um, in uh, 6.77, Dot three four zero is talking about accidents in section B. If a driver in an entertainment transportation vehicle at the time of an accident is involved in bodily injury, is required to report it for a drug test within 24 hours of a time of occurrence at a testing site approved by MTLC. So we'll have there's a relatively short list of uh, places in in around Nashville that can provide DOT style uh, drug testing. We've only had to do that a couple of times over the years, but the other ordinances. Uh, uh, have the same general thing. 
so again, we'll be making those recommendations. Um, the uh, there is a um, under six point seven seven three five zero. Uh, passenger receiving and discharging of dry, uh, discharging by drivers. Um, drivers shall only receive and discharge passengers at designated staging areas and locations approved by the MTLC. Uh, so that that will be something we would ask. There, there's a. Uh, it also. Now I'm not seeing what I want to share with you. There's a in uh, in section 410. Here it is in section 410. Limitation of service due to uh, weather conditions. Entertainment transportation vehicles shall not receive passengers when weather conditions are sufficiently adverse or inclement so as to endanger passengers to the public. The MTLC by rule may adopt specific uh, guidelines for the operation of entertainment transportation vehicles for inclement weather. And then finally, 420 uh, is a section. That uh, that is in violation civil penalty schedule. Uh, the section where uh, it, it that I wanted to make sure I shared with you, uh, the MTLC shall have the authority to promulgate, implement, and enforce additional rules and regulations pertaining to entertainment transportation vehicles, providing such rules and regulations are consistent with the provisions of this chapter. In developing these rules, the Transportation Licensing Commission. Uh, may ensure safety, traffic flow, and compliance with existing noise ordinance, or shall ensure. So th th this is the one where, as you go through your rules, there are four things that I think they're, they're saying. Um, safety, traffic flow, or three, safety, traffic flow, and compliance with existing noise ordinance. Um, those are the areas that the Metro Council has said, ask you to make decisions on. There are other things that uh, were in the original ordinance that I think, uh, I think you'll, want to, you'll probably be looking at. The issue of enclosed versus unenclosed, issues of how noise might be monitored, uh, and other basic issues related to safety inside the vehicles. And again, I think we, as a staff, we intend to share with you some thoughts we have on those issues. Mr. Chairman, that is, uh, and there's some underlining going on here. So I'm going to look. Oh, she's making her own notes. She's I not passing the notes. Okay. Well, I did have a question. Just, excuse me. I did have a question regarding uh, timing as far as um, I know. Um, I know we obviously have a hearing later this month. Are, is there an expectation that the rules will be um, adopted by this commission at that meeting as well? Or is there subsequent um, decision making to be made. I think from from my, from my perspective, I think uh, again, depending on how we walk away today, uh, if we basically are working off this list and the things that are related to this list, you know, we're again we're going to have draft rules. Now that, that by the same token, there are going to be a lot of other people. Once we once we share them with you and they get out of our working hands, we're going to post them on the website. And, and put them up for everybody to see and make suggestions and thoughts or come in and, and holler or be supportive. Uh, this is an issue that the public has uh, a lot of input on and has, has had a lot of input on. If you uh, aren't being tweeted on a daily basis, I encourage you to please let them know and they'll sh share with you your Twitter account. Uh, but uh, it, 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 in all honesty and seriousness, it's, uh, you know, it's a very, it's, it's a very important issue that we deal with. We want to make sure we're giving the best advice we can give that's based on fairness. And uh, we, we are desiring not to be arbitrary or capricious on anything that we offer to you. So the, an the short answer, because, you know, I can't give a short answer. Mm -hmm. The short answer is yes, I would hope you would come out April 28th. If you have the public hearing, if it's an extended public hearing that goes for, and we've had those that go for, you know, two or three hours. Uh, you may not be able to reach decision that day, but we would ask that you'd come back as quickly as you can because at the latest, we'd like for you to, to review the applications that are, the deadline is, and you know, for the public, again, the deadline is Friday at noon. That's the, uh, the, the 14th of April at noon at the commission office hands, uh, not mail, not email, in the hands at noon on Friday. So, the 15th, I'm sorry, April the 15th at noon. Thank you, Miss Steele. Um, have you had many applications? We have only ex only four have been submitted so far, as of noon. Six. six have come. Okay, we're up to six. 
you get six companies with multiple vehicles or six just vehicles? six six companies some are going to be there may be some multiples we haven't started the review process as much as other than review to make sure that the information is provided that we asked for uh, we would anticipate that the I'd hoped would have a special meeting in early May to consider the applications But after looking to the Commission for dates that I could that we would be able to put a quorum together It may be the May the, the the regular meeting in May to be able to do that But the quicker we can have the rules passed the quicker the, the they're approved or disapproved on the application the quicker we can uh, begin the uh, The more challenging part and that's enforcement Relative to 6, uh, 77, 420, the last sentence, that we shall ensure safety, traffic flow, and compliance with existing noise ordinances. That, that seems like our mandate. You know, we, when, when you read through it, it's amazing that you get to the last section of the ordinance. <laughs> but, you know, Article 4 was it's it's straight those are those are as we call them filters that we want you to push everything you push through push through those filters mm -hmm. now it doesn't mean you can't expand and do other things within what the ordinance is but you know look at safety look at traffic flow and look at the uh compliance with the, the existing noise ordinances we we don't have any updated studies that would ensure uh traffic flow we have a, a an older slow moving vehicle traffic study <laughs> but nothing from 2018 we, we we have that study that is it obviously is dated now we have a very efficient and solid engineering staff at NDOT the director is present today what in the conversation I've had with her she's prepared to offer any support and um, uh, you, you know people support, material support, whatever we need for you to be able to have the information you need. If there are specific things that you'd like to have, and I don't choose to speak for the director, but I'm confident in our conversation, she'll, she'll help us again. She is present. I'm seeing her head nodding and she's smiling, so I guess I'm still okay. <laughs> I'm good. Is there a document that you'll get us that says we're, we public works are ensuring traffic flow? I, I think about, you know, Saturday as an example and, and my experience on Second Avenue at about three o'clock, and there were probably 14 buses queued trying to go northbound on Second through Broadway, which is not a, a bus problem. It's it's traffic flow. Mr. Chairman Diana Alarcon, the, the the director of NDOT Good is present. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, and thank you for this quick opportunity. <laughs> uh, currently, there is actually a study underway called Connect Downtown, and uh, we actually have many stakeholders that are involved in this process. And what we are looking at um, through that study is how should we best um, set up our network in the downtown, and, is, and we've expanded the boundaries out a little bit further. So looking at, for example, we understand that at peak time, which varies every Saturday and Sunday based on what's going on downtown. Um, there will be a way for us to look at best way to move people, whether it's on foot, on bike, on car, through the trans entertainment, um, however that falls out after uh, we get through all of this, as well as our transit. We want to make sure we're building in an avenue for the transit. So I'm, I want to share with you that we are looking at it. I'm not going to have a quick fix right away. This is uh, going to really be a long engagement because we have so many stakeholders at the table having the conversation with us, and we want to be respectful of all of those stakeholders. Um, but we do anticipate that we'll have some ideas and recommendations that we'll be able to bring back and share um, over the next um well, I, had, I hope and plan, I hope, I plan on bringing back quarterly updates on the study to y'all just to keep you abreast of what's happening. But by, I want to say, December, January of the, the end of this year, beginning of next year, they will have back, come back to us with recommendations that we'll, I know I'll be sharing with y'all as well as with other folks. But also, um, if there's some budgetary needs, I'll be able to build that into my FYI 24 budget. So it's not a quick fix right now, but we're working on it, it improving it. Sounds like we don't have a great way to ensure traffic flow. We are With working. We, you know, if we have a hundred buses show up that want to get approval. Um, I would definitely recommend that consideration be taken on a cap right now. And then as we are uh, going through the study and have a better idea about 
um, technology improvements that we can do for traffic flows, as well as maybe some designated routes for the, from the transit perspective, how we're going to move cars, how we're going to move people on feet, the scooters, the bikes, everything, um, which is part of why this study is being done. There's tremendous competition for the curb, and everybody wants a piece of it. And so how do we best share it? Um, and how can it best be used from a safety perspective? So perhaps maybe the conversation with the with this um, commission could be perhaps starting off with a cap. That's fair. And then as we actually start fixing and addressing the problem and we come up with the dollars to get it done, we can look at raising that cap. That might be a consideration for the commission. Thank you. Do we have an idea about how many are currently on the street? We've been able to track as many as 61 or 62 vehicles that have come and gone. Lately, we've actually had a few new buses that I'm not sure where they came from. So we're probably closer to, if you took the total up to 70, but out of that number, we've also had many that have gone and haven't come back. So a hard number right now is just, it's, it's really challenging right now to say this is how many we've got because they're coming and going. Uh, uh, first of all, the one through a winter where several of them left and didn't come back. And we've got some others that have come in. So uh, we've, when somebody asked me how many companies I expect, I said on the low end, maybe 20 applications, on the high end, maybe 30. Uh, but they vary from one, one vehicle companies to uh, what to some of them might have as many as 20. And it also is going to depend on how much demand they're having as well. So if a lot of people are wanting the use, we see a pickup. And then if there isn't much of an ask, they do not do it. You know, they're in, they're in, the, they're in the business of creating a, an experience. So it does vary. So I would have to say maybe between 60 to 80. And we are anticipating that that number could rise over the summer months. That was one of the questions I had on the criteria for us to determine whether it's a public convenience and necessity. There seems to only be two criteria outlined in 677.030, which is the number of units that are already on the street, which we were just talking about. And then the next thing is the public need. How is that being measured? Uh, you know, and you were just mentioning that, that it seems to vary based upon the people who are wanting it, but how, how is the commission supposed to evaluate public need in this? How, what's going to be used? Um, from a public need perspective, I would say we're going to recommend, staff's going to recommend going on the law side, on the low side, mm -hmm. because there is truly a traffic um, flow concern today, and that's not even getting into the busiest time of the year. That is very obvious, and especially when we have uh, certain roads that we shut down due to events that are going on, which actually we're getting into that time of the year as well, that crowds it. So I would say um, there's two ways to look at it. There's the public need from our perspective of being able to move people safely on the streets, and then there's the public need of the want of people to be able to utilize the service. So I think it's a balance we're going to need to find. Um, there are times 60 buses that we have out there today is too many on the, on the road. So um, we can definitely come up with a range of recommendation of how many buses we would allow at any given time. I will say when we're closing down streets for, uh, for events that are occurring, such as what we had yesterday, we had the Country Music Awards that occurred in our city, we shut down Broadway. That, that creates and forces traffic out on the other um, arterial roads or even local roads. That actually creates a huge traffic issue as well, puts a huge demand on the, on the, on the, on the resources of the police and fire and to me, that's when the public need on that side is, okay, we want to limit a said number of buses, but on another time when we have all the roads open and it's a beautiful day and it's flowing, we may want to allow this number. So we can certainly set up a range, but the public needs, I think, is on both ways and it's finding that compromise. So there's a balance there between the entertainment need and the, say, just simply the flow of traffic for the people. This, I, and I, I yeah. throw that to safety, yeah. to the safety needs, sir. That was another thing I was going to ask is that I didn't know if the uh, 677420 gave us the authority to uh, make restrictions to the entertainment transportation when there's a major event occurring downtown. Like, for instance, when the NFL had the draft here, I couldn't imagine some entertainment. I mean, I know there'd be a, a need or there'd be a want for it yes. by people visiting our community, but I couldn't imagine trying to go up and down Broadway with the draft going on. Can um, you answer that, Billy? Okay. 
<laughs> she was, so no, 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 I'm happy to answer, but she was pushing her button faster than me. <laughs> no, I, well, this may be the same exact thing that you were going to say, Billy, but it was called out earlier that the staff has the opportunity to designate the zones and routes as well. Um, it would be kind of in that circumstance that they would maybe designate more limited zones and routes for a, you know, a limited period of time. One of the things we've been doing is working at um, uh, working at it from a zone standpoint, yes. and and if I didn't mention, uh, my director is very engaged, and we've been working really trying to think of what makes the best sense, and we we've got some pretty good ideas. There's still a little bit of tweaking we'd like to do, so it may be there are going to be times where we just can't operate in those areas, and it could be like we've had to do with horse-drawn carriages. There's a precedence for this staff and and this commission to say there will not be any operations at certain times because the area in which they operate is basically closed to traffic to start with. D understanding what's going on with uh, entertainment in downtown Nashville, when you have an event uh, like the CMT Awards last night where you have got you know thousands of people on a rainy night wandering in, you you block Broadway and you can't get can't get across, you can't get up and down and that certainly will cause congestion problems. Correct. It does. And it's a safety issue. It truly is a safety issue because I have limited ability to get fire down there for an emergency scenario. If there's an, a huge riot that breaks out, please have the limit to get down there. So during those type of events, we might want to uh, make a recommendation that we actually limit a lot less that can be on the road operating due to the fact that we have a major event occurring in the city. And we do get quite of those asks of us lately. Do you coordinate those events? You know, I get a, a monthly email from Sergeant Bryant at the Metropolitan <coughs> Police Department uh, that's the traffic plan, right? So it's Bridgestone Arena, mm -hmm. Ascend, uh, Nashville Sounds. Are, are those pretty well coordinated with Metro Public Works? Yes. So that you're aware that, hey, we're going to close, we're, we're doing the, the bigger, the small traffic plan. And so, yes, sir. The, uh, the Department of Transportation Multimodal Infrastructure does coordinate on a regular basis with police and fire on all major activities and special events that are occurring, not just in the downtown, but throughout the whole city. So we are one of the things that's actually being worked on right now is creating a special event uh, transport uh, transportation, excuse me, uh, traffic management center that will actually be off of Broadway. So we'll have like a command post that will actually be centered downtown that we will be able to coordinate very closely. We'll actually assign people. So when a special event is current, we'll assign people from our department in there, our traffic engineers, to actually be there to help. So if something changes or there's a need or there's a demand, we're able to address it immediately and quickly and be in real time. Uh, and I'm not an engineer, but I'm in awe as we go forward on this traffic, the, the, this new traffic center they're developing, because it's going to give us, you know, real information. Because in the past, and there's been a lot of past, we've had to guess a lot of times. There's not going to be much guessing. They're going to be, no. they're, they're going to have numbers. And, and I've seen many, many occasions which complicates traffic and these types of vehicles, but where the police will, you know, encourage private property owners to hire multiple off-duty police officers to take your traffic signals and they won't be coordinated and they'll <laughs> take you know first second third and fourth oh, we don't have enough time to talk about that um <laughs> but, I'm trying to think about but more, more holistically right if yeah, we want to yes, move people in traffic Ec absolutely and agree with vehicles. you a hundred percent and that is the direction we're moving in so part of our conversation with police is uh stop you know, they call it the pickle. It's a little remote device that they sit on the corner and they hit it and it changes the signals. And you're absolutely correct. It disrupts the entire flow of traffic. Agree 100% with you. It is an ongoing conversation. Our technology is not where it should be. That allows us to be simulating how to do traffic flows that assist the police versus hindering them. So they go to the only opportunity right now, which is using the pickle and controlling it that way. That really only helps that intersection, but it hits and hurts every other intersection. So that is part of the conversation. That's part of our traffic management system for the whole city that we're working on. And also moving our signals into a more real time adaptive programming. Um, and then part of the Connect Downtown, we will actually be running traffic signalization simulations to understand what is the best way to manage the traffic signals to have the best input in the downtown area to move people cars, the buses, 
all the entertainment um, elements that are in there. So that's part of the Connect Downtown study that's currently underway. That's why I said it's gonna be a pretty intense one. We have a lot of stakeholders at the, at the table to have the conversation so that we have that engagement to try to get it as close to as uh, right, because there's always room for evaluation and improvement. But this is at least gonna give us a good direction to go in and improve how we're doing things. So we're working in that direction. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Mr. Fields, relative to the last question on number 420, we asked you this question uh, really briefly last week. Compliance with existing noise ordinances, and it, it kind of also flows back up to uh, 390B. We'd asked, you know, relative to enforcement about police, where we know we've had some challenges with police officers because they're called to far more um, critical life-saving <laughs> type challenges. You know, are you going to make any recommendations to us or have you decided if you're going to make any recommendations to us or a budget ask that's correlated to fees um, for enforcement personnel? Do you think that's going to roll to public works or are we going to try to get the police to do it? Well, they we, haven't been able to do it so far. We, we've actually... Uh, Beginning on April the 1st, when, when uh, the authority of the commission began, uh, we were able to begin partnering uh, our two inspectors with the police department. So we've, we've begun developing that part, that uh, relationship that we, we've always had a good working relationship, but they're actually patrolling together now uh, a couple of nights a week where they're working, uh, doing a lot of educating. But the police have, and I'll, again, I'll defer back to legal, we, th this commission or its staff cannot enforce the noise ordinance. We can, however, uh, work with the police to, uh, to make sure it is happening. And again, I'll, we, we do have limited authority. We can enforce 677, but we can't enforce the- 390. Yeah, so and as far as issuing a citation for a noise ordinance violation, that would normally be police or codes that would do that. Um, however, we can kind of incorporate into our regulations a provision that if a violation is identified by one of those departments, that will put that licensee um, in dis disciplinary jeopardy with this commission. So, so you could take that into account kind of after the fact. Is that what you were thinking too, Billy? Exactly. I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, because there are things we can do and we're going to do it. Those things we can't, we're going to be working to find ways to, to make it happen. You know, as far as the noise in particular, one of the things you're going to see recommendations is we've been exploring a variety of manners in which to control the sound, ranging from actually governing devices that could be placed on the equipment itself to, de to decibel readers that are on there that would actually save that information where we can go back and say, you know, on the 14th at 2.30, I mean, this is what it's showing. Uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead. We're going to be asking for GPS, uh, GPS on all the vehicles so we know where they are. Mm -hmm. We're going to be asking for cameras on the front and the back, not showing the inside, but showing the outside. We want to, we, <laughs> we want to ensure their safety. And we want to make sure we can see what people say we see. Because a lot of times, you know, I've been doing this a long time and listened to a lot of complaints, and, and many of them are, are certainly valid and some of them are not. We want to be in a place where we can say, yep, that happened. You were there. You're telling me you're not. Well, the GPS says you were. Uh, we require that on taxi cabs. So it's, this isn't new. This isn't, this, this is, uh, uh, there's no precedent being set for these kind of things. Uh, we want to, uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, they're safe. They're compliant. We want to make sure traffic flows. We, you know, we want to make sure and we want people to have a good time. This is not about putting people out of business. This is just, you know, trying to set up some standards, just like all of the other ordinances that you operate under. That that, and we've been successful with those. I fully expect to be successful with this. Yeah, and, and Billy's right. I overlooked that as, as, you know, I guess kind of an enforcement mechanism in the sense that uh, one of the things you can do with these regulations is that you can write them to require certain equipment on vehicles. And, you know, if that equipment is useful for the purposes of ensuring compliance with the noise ordinance, that fits within this scope. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, I mean, again, there's not secrets. I've, many of these people, have, I've been in meetings with a lot of them, and I'll continue, I'm sure, to be in meetings with them. You know, I, I want to make sure if people are, if, if someone were to stand up on, on a vehicle, I want to make sure there's something they can catch themselves without, for whether it's a strap that's above their head or a rail, or we've all, maybe not all been on subways and buses and such, but we want basic safety. I want safety at the doors. I don't want somebody to be able to tumble out of a door, which a lady did a few weeks ago in California. I want to make sure there's a physical barrier. I don't want a little place 
plastic chain. I'm going to be recommending a, 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 a an approved, and I'm not sure there won't be one thing fits all, but something that we know will be a barrier that they may can get over, but they got to work to get over it. They're not just going to accidentally fall over. <laughs> Same way with rail heights. We'll be the Metro's building code requires a 42 to 48 inch rail uh, on uh, on on business balconies and such. Uh, not so for homes, but we're going to be, if, if they don't have existing rails, we're going to be talking about those sort of things and bringing a hard <coughs> rule saying this is what it has to be, and if we put a tape measure on it and don't match, then it don't qualify. To follow up on, to follow up on Michael's question about building in a budget uh, for additional inspector or inspectors mm -hmm. and, and building that into permit mm -hmm. fee, we will be able to do that. Yes, and we've also, uh, and uh, the director has already, uh, has begun the process to bring more staff. Uh, uh, T.D. Schlafer is back here now, and I should have introduced him at the last meeting. He is dealing with scooters and those sort of issues. I've also been dragging him into other things, so he is, uh, uh, the staff is fully engaged, at, uh, at all of us, to, uh, to, we're trying to work through these things. So yes, I think there's going to be additional inspectors uh, or compliance officers brought in, as well as other resources to bear out of NDOT, where there can hopefully be some cross-training to be able to give, uh, whether we can support and they can support us. I understood that the perp one of the purposes of this meeting today was to identify things we would like to hear during the public <coughs> hearing meeting. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I would like some information about, and I don't need it today, is what is the noise ordinance? How is it measured? What is it, you know? Uh, so they have a, a base to make some decisions on uh, regarding the entertainment transportation vehicles. The other thing I'd like to also see on the uh, 28th is how long have, how long as best we can estimate that these buses and entertainment transportations have been operating in Nashville and what, what are the known accidents that have occurred and, and, and the nature of them. So we can think about the things that you've already mentioned, Mr. Fields, of preventing accidents from happening in the future. Yes, sir. I've heard anecdotally about accidents, but I just don't, I'd like to have someone tell me uh, the ones that have actually, that are, they actually know about. With permission, I can sort of answer the first question. Um, so um, the chapter of the Metropolitan Code that contains the noise ordinance is chapter 920. Um, it is Metro Legal's interpretation of that ordinance that um, it already includes vehicles such as party buses um, or entertainment transportation vehicles. Um, however, the most recent amendment to the Metro Code that included the addition of this Chapter 677 that we're discussing today also amended Chapter 920 to make it just super crystal clear that it did apply to entertainment transportation vehicles. So that's what this refers to. And what, I'm, what I'd like to hear on the 28th is What's a violation of the noise ordinance? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is it, I mean, do you know? Is it 50? It's audible, 50. It's, it's audible within 50 audible feet. Audible within 50 feet. Um, and then there's another noise ordinance that's 85 decibels. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. within, fit, within four feet above grade at 50 feet? I'd have to look it up. <laughs> Same one that applies to bars and nightclubs yeah. and restaurants. Any yeah, that kind that of was the activity. amendment that Ms. Costones was talking about. They just wanted to make sure it was clear that the vehicles that we're talking about, uh, any of them would be. Uh, uh, subject to the noise ordinance in 920. Is audible at 50 feet just to the average? How, how is that measured? Because what I can hear at 50 feet might be different than what she can hear at 50 <laughs> feet and so on and, and, and so forth. And, and, and that's the reason what we'll, we'll bring. The, there's two agencies of government that can uh, enforce the police department, the coach department. We'll ask them to uh, be prepared. Uh, in fact, I'll speak with. Uh, we'll speak with them. Maybe we'll be able to get you something in advance to, if there's already a, a, an information sheet that we could provide to you. But we'll we'll make sure that they're present at the meeting and in, um, in at the end of the month to be able to share that. Is there a variation on the noise ordinance depending on the, the potential zone? Like if they're, you know, driving past school versus, you know, not doing that. I mean, is there a, a greater noise, noise uh, restriction? So I think you can address that in setting routes and zones in the first place. Like if you want them to stay 
a certain distance away from locations like that during school hours or something like that. If you had schools, hospitals, whatever, daycares, um, in your rules, you could actually do, and we would we would carve those out. Uh, we would work with the planning department to identify those locations and then carve them out to make sure there were uh, silent zones or just no-go zones, depending on the will of the commission. But I think that's a good question. Does Metro have a variance on the noise ordinance if you're near a hospital or a school versus in a residential neighborhood or near the stadium? Or is it just right. one blanket rule it's in the, it's the, in the board? Yeah, it, I pulled it up. I pulled up the chapter, although I wasn't looking for that specifically. It's generally um, based on zoning. So, like, different zoning areas have different, like, you know, um, uh, rules that apply to them in terms of noise. Um, uh, the one that's specific to vehicles currently says no person, op well, actually it was amended. If, what's um, uh, on muni codes? published um, version um, says no person operating or occupying a motor vehicle on any street, highway, alley, parking lot, or driveway, either public or private property, shall operate or permit the operation of any sound amplification system, this is a little dated, including but not limited to any radio, tape player, compact disc player, <laughs> loudspeaker, or any other electrical device used for the amplification of sound within the motor vehicle so that the sound is plainly audible at a distance of 50 feet um, from the vehicle or in the case of a motor vehicle on private property beyond the property line. Just, uh, I'll give you a point of context relative to noise and, and I think you'd asked kind of how loud it is. We've done uh, ambient background noise studies where we placed, uh, you know, I, I engaged a professional to design a building to try to isolate noise. So we did noise studies over about a six, <clears throat> maybe eight square block area between first and fourth, um, the Shelby Street Bridge or Sigenthaler Bridge and Peabody Street. So a big swath of the area south of Broadway. Ambient background noise generally was at about 74 decibels. 85, we're probably, I'm probably talking at about 80 to 81 right now, right? So 85, the, the threshold is, is pretty low. Um, if you and I were talking, we wouldn't hear it from 50 feet away. But like the, the, the pedal tavern that went by my restaurant at lunch today, you know, where they're banging on the side of it and playing music and amplified speakers, that's running 90, 92, right? It's, a, it's above the threshold. I could clearly, the, the 50 foot distance is kind of, if you're across the street and you can hear it, it's too loud. And we're not seeing any enforcement that I'm aware of. I don't know how many tickets you see, but any enforcement of that, which is a hard thing if we're, if our task is to. Um, Ensure safety, traffic flow, and compliance with the And compliance, I don't know how we could really, like even the ones which I, I really am thankful for the ones that have, they've placed covers on them, but then they open the back windows and the noise comes out. Or the polycarbonate tops have little holes in it and the noise comes out. I can hear it 200 feet away through my insulated glass in my office. And, that, and that's where I think from, from the staff standpoint, we're gonna be working hard on technology uh, we even uh, uh, visited with, uh, with the uh, uh, founder and inventor of silent events mm. to look at uh, the activity. For those that aren't familiar, certainly in the audience, please look at YouTube uh, or you can go to silent events, but that's where you actually use headphones and uh, you, you hear... It's, it's like silent disco at Bonnaroo. It's I mean, I've never You've been, probably never been. I've never it's, been it's, to a bar. But, no, uh, it, it, at the Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival, they've got a whole... Silent disco full yeah. of people dancing with that. We, we had a very uh, good meeting with the owner. He has pledged his support to work with uh, the commission uh, as, as one of the, and that is, I mean, I keep giving all my surprises away, but that would be, uh, uh, that would be an option that I think uh, changes. You know, one of the things that's there, if, if they're operating in silence and they're operating the vehicle safely and the drivers have the CDLs with a P, endorsements and and the vehicles are following all of the mechanical issues it's a very different vehicle than one with uh with that, that's unenclosed that i mean as we've had in the past i mean as we go forward i fully expect people to uh, i expect compliance i absolutely do i think it's gonna be challenging i think we've got to work at it really hard but i think we can do tech i think there's certain technologies we can apply and then i think we've got to follow them back up but i want measurables um 
because I can measure by the number of tickets given, but what I'd like to know is how often, if we can put a governing device or a, uh, uh, a uh, some sort of a, uh, a recording device that actually records decibel levels. So when somebody says, you know, I was at the corner such and such a certain time, well, I've got the GPS, I've got the decibel, and yeah, you could have been over. So, but you know, it's when you get to Broadway and talking with the companies and they, they're gonna share a lot with you on this. When you're on Broadway, you do have to, if you're gonna hear on that, you'd, you'd turn it up. But I, by the same token, when you're driving down Second Avenue or Third or Fourth and you're not right on Broadway, it needs to come back down to where it's not a 50, a violation. So that, again, that's the challenge is fi finding that balance. I'm always perplexed by the decisions we have to make here that uh, are mandated by, required by the public convenience and necessity, and I always try to look at what criteria we're, we're faced with. From what I've seen so far, there's at least five in this ordinances that, are, that have been identified. In Article 4, you have safety, traffic flow, and compliance with no noise ordinances. And then in 677.3, Point zero three zero. they talk about the public need which seems to be splintered between entertainment need and community or business needs downtown and then also to consider the number of units on the street there's also the catch-all in B that says such certain such criteria as the MTLC may adopt I'd be interested in knowing what the other commissioners have what other thoughts you can think of as far as criteria for determining the public convenience and necessity, if there is, if anybody has other ones. I've tried to think really hard on, first, what's the public, and is it Davidson County residents and taxpayers and voters, or is it the people that are coming from out of town? Well, I think that's where you see the public need, it's splintered there between perhaps the business people downtown, the people who live downtown, and the people who visit the entertainment need. But I also recognize that the entertainment need has a lot of taxpayers and people and businesses here in Nashville that make a, a, a living, uh, and a lot of people who are making their living off of the entertainment uh, need that is in this community. So I see that as splendid. I'm just curious, is there, are there other things that people are looking at for a criteria for determining the public convenience and necessity. We focused a lot on safety and traffic flow and noise ordinance. Um, as, um, I, I, I haven't been able to figure out the public need, candidly. Right, I mean, yes, there are people that, that make their living out of it, and we've received letters from people who employ a quarter million people, but on the flip side, the, the nuisance piece of noise and traffic far outweighs the jobs. You know, people moving out of buildings, people, office buildings, residential buildings, hotel guests complaining at three in the morning, the letters about conventions that don't come back to Nashville because it's overrun with these vehicles. It's a, it's a really tough one. Like I, I empathize with the people who have made big investments in the space. If I might submit, that probably is the argument or discussion we'll have during the uh, public <laughs> hearing rather than today because right. I think there's a number of people out there that would love to jump up and say something. I'm just trying to identify the factors that we need to consider uh, during the public hearing. And I think I've, I've come up with five from what's been presented to us here, and I didn't know if there were any others that folks had um, that commission members wanted to bring up to the table today. For the veterans of the commission and the public, that it's certainly followed it over the years. That's been one of the great challenges on taxi cabs. Uh, in 2013, we had a uh, we had very clear uh, needs that we could show from a public standpoint of the number of cabs that had been suppressed for years uh, by uh, by the commission, not for any reason other than we couldn't prove. When we got to 13, we had you know, half a dozen companies said, here, let me show you. And they came in statistically showing what, what was out there and what was the use and that sort of thing. Uh, in taxi cabs, we've used the number of hotel beds, you know, uh, pillows on the head or heads on the pillows. Uh, we, you know, we can look at uh, conferences coming. And I, I, I think what I think you'll see, I think some of that 
evidence uh, will come from the industry. They're they're going to show their their needs, just like as we, we'll go forward in May, we're going to probably be talking about scooters some. And, uh, and there are going to be statistics that uh, they'll provide their statistics that we'll provide as well. We're, we're looking at heat maps every day and uh, uh, TD more than me. But, uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the kind of usage. And, and again, that's the challenge is, is you've got the good news is you've got five that the council has said use, so we can certainly use those. If you have others, uh, I think the only thing we'd need to do is you'd need to identify them, pass them as a rule, and then use them. And you'd pass that in April, and then when you make the decisions in May, they will be in effect, and you could use them to make your decisions. What is the determination for the number of buses that's going to be the, or vehicles that's going to be the right number? I mean, how, how, what, what do you, what do you do? I mean, what do you go by? We don't have the study from NDOT yet. They're, that's, they're saying that that's, what, a year or so, January, February away. So how are we going to determine how many we're going to permit? What, are, you know, what, what are we going to do? How I mean, are we going to select them? How are there going to be limitations on how many vehicles one company can have? Um, uh, so what we have done in the past with other types of um, passenger vehicles for hire that do have that public necessity and convenience criteria applied to them um, is we've generally taken a lot of evidence, you know, in terms of testimony and public hearings, um, mostly from the industry and from the police department to kind of balance those two sides of the consideration. Um, that Mr. Commissioner Hayes was talking about. So um, uh, another factor that can like very practically, um, and Billy maybe can speak to this better than I can, but um, uh, factor into kind of like what number of vehicles the infrastructure can sustain um, uh, has to do um, maybe with um, uh, like resting areas when not in use because like with the horse-drawn carriages we needed a tether location with the um, uh, cabs their cab stands um, and um, so and then this ordinance um, anticipates um, locations for standing as well um, and loading so um, depending on maybe how many locations you identify for that that may speak to some degree to what like kind of capacity the infrastructure can sustain. Does that make sense? I think she's exactly right about horse-drawn carriages. Uh, at one point, we had as many as three carriage stands. We have one carriage stand now. It can support, at one time, it can support a couple of carriages. So if you assume there's two on the street and two operating, there's four that could be moving around. Uh, depending on the will of the commission, as well as in consultation with the Traffic and Parking Commission, the, the way the, the loading zones are not controlled by the Transportation Licensing Commission. You can authorize them, but Traffic and Parking is the commission that is responsible for saying what they can be used for. Uh, if, if these vehicles are all loading off site, for instance, uh, I, I visited a site not long ago with one of the companies, and they've created a site. They've gone into a, 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 a an industrial area actually and uh, developing a place where they will stage the loading and unloading their buses and their intention is to operate it and you start at that point a you do your tour and you come back to point a uh, versus others that will, will want and have loaded and unloaded downtown uh, that that's a problem I'm gonna tell you tell everybody in the, in the room that's a problem for me I, I loading and unloading downtown we have a great deal of traffic that's moving on a daily basis we have thousands of people that are on the streets. We've got everything competing for space. We don't need anything impeding any, any lane, parking, anything else downtown. If they, we've, we've got to find ways to keep things moving. If they're gonna be licensed, they're gonna to have to keep moving. That's my speech on that. Oh, I remember when we were talking about the pedal taverns at times that there was some discussion about the number of permits that company could have, but they would have had agreement that they'd only have one vehicle on the road at any given time because they had problems with, or they could face problems where one vehicle might be broken down and things of that nature. Are we looking at that kind of situation with these companies as well for the entertainment transportations? Possibly. I mean, I think what happened in that situation is that 
they had one permit for one vehicle, mm -hmm. but maybe they owned three vehicles. And if one of them was in the shop, then they could transfer yeah. that permit to, you know, the, one of the extra ones. We, we do that with, with horse-drawn carriages, for instance. And we do it with the pedal carriages as well, where we'll license multiple vehicles and it'll be available for service. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the largest carriage company, Sugar Creek, has, I think, 14 carriages. And, uh, and I've not inspected them yet this year. But, uh, you know, our intention is to, we'll permit all of them but we don't allow them on the street all at one time. And that's the discussion. We'll, I can assure you this November when we have your annual meeting, there'll be discussion about should we allow additional on the street. But again, part of it is we, we continue to have, we don't have the data that we need to give you uh, at the present time that we will have in you know the first quarter of next year. Uh, right now, we wanna, again, we have to operate with what we have based on uh, uh, what the ordinance says, what the testimony and evidence is that's provided, and then your best judgment uh, setting on the commission. And as I tell people on a regular basis, this may be the most thoughtful and um, engaged commission in the city. No disrespect to any other commission, but you certainly are an engaged group of people. Currently, um, and, and do, does the Metro Code anticipate us being able to regulate um, where these businesses load and unload. I mean, I, I believe you just said that we, that would not fall under our purview or would it? Sort of. So, so as far as like designating, um, what, what Director Alarcon was talking about the, um, uh, the curbside, right. So the D Traffic and Parking Commission makes designations of loading and unloading zones. That's that's their purview. Um, but th 350 does said, um, uh, pa drivers shall only receive and discharge passengers as designated staging areas, locations approved by the MTLC. So that might be one of your um, designations is they can only do this at passenger loading and unloading zones, or they can only do this at certain passenger loading and unloading zones. But certainly I'm sure that the NDOT staff would inform like what works as far as that's concerned. So uh, thank you very much, um, Diana Alarcon again. I would uh, like to have the opportunity to bring forward recommendations about loading uh, where they can at this time in loading and unloading zones uh, to pick up or drop off. Um, and kind of regulate it during while we have the study going on. And then when the study's complete, we'll have a more um, detailed data information that we can share that'll have a more holistic view. But we certainly have um, ideas about what would be most appropriate to reduce the amount of traffic congestion, safety for the folks that are getting off and on. But I think uh, Billy makes a very valid point for consideration for the commission, and that is they should be able to pick folk, folks up at their place of establishment and then drop them off. We do have a bit of a challenge uh, and we have received a lot of letter of complaints that have come in on the pedal taverns where they'll stop at a bar, let people off, go in, refresh up, use the bathroom and then they'll come back. Meanwhile, they're, they're blocking traffic, they're not in an unloading zone and it's a bit problematic. Um, so uh, we would like to recommend through this that we would have designated areas um, and we would, would like to work with them on that because that is you know, I'm, I'm not out to ruin someone's business, but I am about safety, and that's my number one element. And even though they're cu it's their customers, the minute they step off, they're my customers. <laughs> so I think of it in that perspective, and I want to have a nice balance of safety for everybody. So uh, we would definitely bring that back as a recommendation. Would, would NDOT have that by the public hearing? Yes, sir. We will pull that together and have that available. I've already made that note. Do you think 77420 allows us? I mean, it, it seems that's a catch-all. Enforce additional rules and regulations. As long as they're not inconsistent with the, the code provisions. Which sounds like it's safety. And, I mean, and traffic. I think 350 <laughs> says we can do it already. <laughs> right, but. Right. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, if you mean from the loading and unloading, yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think she, Ms. Costonas is correct. Um, the, uh, where they're picked up, even if you allow them to stop on tour, you, they, unless you allow it, you, I think you have the authority to do that. 
if you want them all to load and unload, if you say you go to commerce, go to first, go to third, second, whatever. I think you can do that by rule. As long as we've got a, a, a reason, and if safety is your reason and we demonstrate it, I think you're fine. If I can switch uh, horses a little bit here to uh, 677.340 accidents, uh, I was interested in the choice of 24 hours for the drug screen. Uh, and I was, if, it, it says that if there's an accident involving bodily injury, um, I'm assuming the operator must report for a drug screen within 24 hours from the time of the occurrence. You know, alcohol obviously would be gone within a couple hours or, you know, uh, the metabolic rate of cocaine and various other substances uh, deteriorates within six, seven hours or so. What do we get with a 24-hour mandate to get a drug testing in by? We've not been involved in drug testing in a while uh, within the ordinance. We've not been involved in drug testing in the ordinance for in any of the ordinance for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. The council took that out. Uh, they've had, but it's always been on the accident part. Uh, we've only had it. We've only it's only been used a few times because we've been very lucky. We've not had many bodily injuries or the things that we have. Uh, uh, we've regulated, but it, but but you're 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 right, and uh, and that may be something. If if the commission uh, likes, we can go back to council and and uh, ask for additional information. And Miss Elacron is here, and she might have some more information. <laughs> so if a if a accident occurs, and we like to call them crashes in the transportation world, does occur, and it involves police, they're doing a sobriety check on the spot. So if alcohol is involved, they're going to catch it right then and there. If let's say the sobriety comes out clean and yet they feel that it may do to some other influence, the 24 hour would catch that. So I would say most likely if there is an accident occurs, the police are going to be involved. They're going to require a sobriety check. They're going to get that for us. And then the 24 hours, if that comes back clean, then there's the opportunity to do the drug test in the 24 hours, which we would catch it. And then therefore we'd be able to say this person can no longer be driving and would lose their ability to have a license to be out on the street. But if there's a property damage accident, the police may not get called. And I know that they're, the operator or the company's under an obligation to report it within 72 hours. Um, my concern was that there would be types of accidents that might slip through here. There is always that possibility, sir. I'm not going to deny it because we're, you know, they're supposed to be uh, on the honest Mm -hmm. um, program, the honesty program, where they're actually reporting it. At 72 hours, we're not going to catch anything. So um, unless they're called, if it's a property damage where they create damage to another private property, hopefully that private property will make the phone call and the police will be involved. Otherwise, they may not ever inform us and we're none more aware than we were the day before or the time it occurred. But um, if we are aware of it, we're going to bring in the police department. They're going to do their check. And then if we still deem that it's necessary, we would ask for the 24 hours on the drug. I'm just concerned that 24 hours is too long a period of time for drug detection on a number of the uh, most drugs drug you, out there. Most drugs you can catch in the first 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I can't think of one right now off the top of my head. I cannot find it in, you know, in the urine analysis. Cocaine, I'm going to find. Um, um, med I can't even name them all. I'm sorry. I'm not experienced in it, and I don't want to be. But I'm from my from what I've been explained and I have been educated on. We're going to catch about 90 percent of any of those type of drugs. Mm -hmm. There's not really much we're going to miss in a urine sample. Could could we ask for a more stringent test, like a hair test? I'm going to leave that up to Teresa. <laughs> to answer. Well, speaking as a guy without much hair, the problem with hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're definitely putting you on the honesty yeah, no, roll. <laughs> from, what, from what I know about hair testing is that uh, many of the drugs are in hair from years, years. before. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's not going to help us any with uh, measuring whether from somebody yesterday. was under the influence or not at the time of an accident. Yeah, so. yeah the urine analysis is really a pretty good pickup mm. and is what's commonly used in most fields. And all it says is um, a, a drug screen. It doesn't specify the method, um, so I guess you all could, you know, make a recommendation on that as well.
in the meantime, as the discussion is quieted down, in the meantime, between now and the next few weeks, if there are issues that come up, don't talk to each other, obviously, and you never do that. Mm -hmm. But if you'll send an email to Teresa and I, we will uh, do our best to put together the information or the expert that you'd like to have. If there's a you know a detail that you that may that you'd like for NDOT to address or the police department or the planning department, you know one thing I would, as Mr. Hayes asked, we don't have a lot of control over where they operate. I mean that's going to be a land use issue. As long as if they, the zoning is there, then they could operate whatever they may operate. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, the other things that, that Ms. Costona spoke of and the director spoke of, you do have that authority. So, um, uh, if, so if issues come up, please let us know. We'll get it as quickly as we can. We've got a little more drafting to do. What we intend to do is, uh, is uh, take what you've talked about today, make sure that we've got some addressing. I think we've, I think of the ones I shared with you earlier and read into, the, into your meeting today, we've addressed and we've got some ideas. We just keep adding to. I did want to just, as you're thinking about these, uh, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but your um, advice to us next week, uh, if there is a way to consider uh, the special events, so the Ascend, the Bridgestone, the Nashville Sounds, and if we're talking about uh, geographic areas where these things can operate, you know, it, the hard part is these companies and the, the tourists that want to book them, want to book their experiences, uh, I'm assuming, more than a month out. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's, hey, we get to Nashville and, God, that looks fun and I want to hop on one of those and I start looking around. I don't know. Um, but if if we can look at the events, look at road closures. So I think about First Avenue is closed northbound because of the bomb. Second Avenue is closed as well, right? Those might want to be off limits. Third Avenue, we get, a, we get traffic police out there every day from 3 to 6 o'clock in front of the Pinnacle Building to get their cars out which doesn't let vehicles circulate northbound because the police are stopping the cars. First, second, third are constrained. Fourth, fourth flows southbound at peak times. Uh, but if we look at you know things like temporary construction lane closures for digging fiber and water main breaks, and how do we, how do we get into all those other traffic problems that we're having, and then we layer these slow-moving vehicles in, and then create some, you know, some sort of framework around how they can operate. I mean, you you, you raise a, one of the more challenging issues we have is uh, if we we used to try to operate the carriages, for instance, on routes, uh, and they work fine if the roads are all open. If the roads aren't open, it's well, it is now. When in 2002, when we started regulating those, which was one of our one of our best ordinances we wrote at the time, it was the first one we wrote. Um, but that we put together again, it worked. But the times are, are different. You know, 20 years later, we're sitting here with. Uh, uh, I suspect in 2002, it was still illegal to live downtown. Uh, it's not now. You can have an apartment. Condos. I think it was eight, eight, 98 or 99. 98, I, was I, would, I, I moved downtown in 2003. Yeah. I, mean, you uh, know exactly. I, was, I was one of 600 people that yes. uh, lived there. So the, time the time. downtown neighborhood, uh, as uh, former vice chair of the commission would say, Mr. Turner out there, the downtown neighborhood is very different today, and it is a neighborhood. So, you know, that's the reason I avoid uh, uh, what I want are, are, are big enough zones to give an opportunity to operate, but but carefully crafted zones that will keep them in areas where they will be less opportunity to have a compliance issue. You're probably not gonna play your music too loud on Broadway, but you can definitely, in other parts, you can play your music too loud. Have any of the larger operators come to you with ideas of zones, like let's circle the Titan Stadium? Actually, that's one of they call, as I remember, they call that the money shot. So they, they like to go across the river. They like to pull down, uh, is it Titan's Way? Is that the one that runs by the river? You pull down Titan's Way and you stop and they take the selfies and that's the money shot. And that's the one you see on every major event that comes to Nashville. That's one of the big shots you see. So, you know, what we've got to do uh, in, in, in working with zones, for instance, uh, 
the director sat down with us and we looked at, okay, do, if we take them here, is there less impact? We give them over this particular bridge to get them to this particular point. And so we, we've working with, uh, with, with expert with expert advice and engineering support, we hope we're going to bring you some ideas and hope they're going to have more ideas. And, you know, we also like to do this because uh, there's some places I just don't think you can go. I don't think you, I mean, whether it's a traffic issue or a safety issue or a noise issue, there's some places it's just better not to go. So it's uh, April 28th is going to be a very uh, a challenging day. Uh, you know, I'm not even going to say we'll make half the people happy, but but we're 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 hoping that we're going to bring, from a staff standpoint, we're going to bring good ideas. I'm hoping that the public is going to come and bring their best ideas, uh, whether they're for or against. So you'll have all the information to make those decisions that you have. Mr. Fields, it probably would be helpful to know from the industry how far in advance people are making reservations and how the reservations are being done, whether they're on the spot or whether they're, they're on websites or what, and then also whether they are turning people away. I remember one of the industries that we evaluated one time, they came in with evidence of how many prospective customers they were having turn away because they didn't have enough vehicles. So that would be helpful to know too. I'm, I'm very close to the audience. I hear clicking as we go. I'm very <laughs> confident there's, there's thumbs working right now. Just a few feet from us, you will probably have various companies making various reports to you by in the morning, certainly no later than thir by the end of the week. If they're also listening, I'd like to know what impact they are having on the economy of this community and how they're measuring that impact. Not just what they anecdotally think, but what is their impact and how are they measuring it? You have delivered the message. <laughs> I, I, I do think if those party people are here and we didn't have these vehicles, they would find plenty of other places to have a good time and cause a really healthy economic impact for our city. Just an anecdotal thought, right? I have nothing to do on a Saturday. I'll go find a bar or restaurant or something fun to do. Is that testimonial today or is that just <laughs> your, no, your no, opinion? No, look, look, you know, look, we, we, own, we own bars and restaurants and hotels. And, and I have a lot of friends that come to town that always are looking for something to do. And it's, I mean, it, honestly, it's, these vehicles do provide a service. It's something for people to do that want to get out and have a good time. And I've heard plenty of people argue for it. I have friends that have taken them and really enjoyed themselves. Um, and as I think about my friends that come to visit, and I've, I've never advised somebody to go hop on a bus, um, but I do think, like, what, what would I do if I was here for three or four days, and would it be fun? Um, and I'm sure there's a, a whole swath of folks that love it. In, in the past, when we've had public hearings um, and testimonials, um, have we had uh, people uh, swear under oath that they're going to tell the truth, the whole truth? I know we have when we have complaints heard. Yeah, but, that's but a I, great question. Um, generally, we have not, but maybe we should. Um, that's not a bad idea. Um, definitely, we have had that come up in the context of disciplinary hearings. And um, uh, I think mostly for Mr. Blackburn. And we um, adjusted the practice accordingly and, and begun to swear people in at the um, you know, disciplinary hearings where people were giving testimony that would actually result in consequences of discipline. Um, but in this case, certainly um, given the potential um, appealability of um, determinations of um, uh, um, you know, allocations of vehicles or whatever, um, you know, if somebody is upset about that and does try to um, take their um, uh, 
appeal um, to the writ of certiorari um, as described at the beginning of the meeting, um, then having sworn testimony as a part of the um, board's consideration, um, uh, you know, might be helpful for that purpose. So, I mean, it is, um, it's not something that you have a rule now that says you do or don't have to do, but you could decide to do it. You make your, your own rules of procedure, basically. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm definitely aware of that Chancery Court decision from a few years ago that actually suggested that it would be helpful um, when there are appeals, when if there's testimony to be considered that it was under oath as opposed to it not being. Mm -hmm. so. Let me make sure, uh, Ms. Costonis. So, if they decide they want to do that at the uh, at the April uh, uh, public hearing, they would simply begin the meeting. And they, in other words, they, they wouldn't have to have a rule that says we're going to do it. But it'd be a decision from the chair or a decision of the commission that day to take sworn testimony. I mean, if they're if they want it to be like a permanent change going forward, then I would suggest adding it to the rules. Um, but if it's just kind of a field decision almost in one particular hearing, then I, you know I think as long as you all vote to do it, it would be okay. But like I said, you know, if that's something we want to do consistently going forward, and it might be a very good idea because anything can really lead to an appeal, then we might want to add, formally add a rule. Uh, and I guess since we're, you know, April's going to be a public hearing anyway, we could actually add that as I guess the first thing if that's what they wanted to do. But you wouldn't have to do that that meeting. If you want to do it at the commission before the public hearing begins, someone would make a motion and it would be discussed and you would make a decision yes or no. Maybe I don't understand exactly what we're discussing. Are you talking about an oath just for someone making a public comment on the rules? Yeah. Or in a particular disciplinary action? So in a particular disciplinary action, we already do do it. Right. That's absolutely right. But if the testimony that is effectively evidence that this commission is going to take into consideration um, in making a decision, say, for example, like... Um, how many vehicles does it really suit the public convenience and necessity to, to, to permit? Um, and then how are you going to allocate that number amongst all the different companies? You know, um, that, that something like that, that could lead to an appeal. Um, I'm not saying it will, but I mean, it could. Um, uh, you know, there, um, there are arguments that, you know, maybe that testimony would like to be, would be, more um, persuasive if it was taken under oath. Yeah. It is difficult. I, I agree. Not gonna oppose it. I, not it, sure. it would be I'm difficult sorry. because I, many times when we hear public comment, it's opinion. Uh, it's not. They're not presenting facts. Um, and so it's it's one thing, perhaps, and maybe this is built into the application of requiring the applicant to pro provide truthful testimony as part of their application. Yeah, I think that's true that we do require some of the, we require some of the provisions of the application to be certified under oath, do we not? And um, so definitely um, in that sense, if information is given in the context of filling out the application, then that would be certified under oath. Um, I, you know, the, the more factual testimony that we get in those types of situations is usually the very specific evidence presented by the industry representatives in terms of, like, how many people they've had to turn away, like you were talking about, or, um, you know, police officers talking about their experiences in terms of, like, you know, what Broadway is like on Saturday night, so. Yeah, they're, they're, the application that all the companies have been filling out do is a... Uh, uh, the swearing or affirmation that all the information that is being filed of this uh, on this application is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. Then goes on and certifies that all drivers and vehicles meet the appropriate sections of 677 uh, and certify that all insurance coverage that's required is in place and will remain in place during the time the company's operating within the metropolitan area. So we either we can know we can have them swear at the office or they can bring it in from their own. And if no. they were ever um, subsequently determined to have committed a violation that, or to have, um, if, if a fact comes to light subsequently that something that they swore to be true was not true, that's a disciplinary, disciplinary matter. 
And I think that's all real appropriate, but I think I'm with Carrie in terms of public comment. You don't want it to have a chilling effect on the public who just want to give their opinion or explain <coughs> their experience and how that would influence a decision. I, I'd be really cautious about that. It's up to us to figure out whether they're full of you know what. <laughs> Well, uh, before before um, I ask the question, if if we're done, as Mr. McNally has just asked me, um, are there any other questions that people would like to address in advance of next week's meeting? Um, we obviously have legal here. We can, if there are any other concerns we have about our authority, um, this is the meeting to ask those questions so we can streamline next week's meeting as much as possible to focus on the public hearing and the rulemaking. Um, well, this is a really minor issue, but um, the one section that we didn't really talk about was inclement weather. Uh, will you all have some recommendations about that? Because sort of deciding weather questions seems a little challenging. We've been looking over uh, uh, various kinds of very hard uh, information from a standpoint of, you know, tornado warnings, tornado, uh, high wind advisories. Because again, if some of the vehicles are, are higher, you know, is that an issue? You know, we, we've addressed in other or parts of the air rules, you have addressed uh, ice and, uh, and snow, but I think this brings a whole different kind of thing to bear. Uh, Cause the only other, we've got some, so I, yes, we've got some recommendations. I'm sorry, I just can't answer questions quick. <laughs> I, and I may have misspoke. I, I was referencing the April 28th hearing. Not, not, there's not a hearing next week. I, I may have said next week. <laughs> got, no, I got, I, I got it. Hey, read, quick, this is a quick question. Reading the, the or hopefully it's a quick answer. Reading the, the um, inclement, inclement weather policy, where is the, is there a policy that states that vehicles must be enclosed? Also, it's that's actually one of the things that uh, the, the the Metro Council took it out. They, if you, uh, so we we could, we could add back in if we so cho chose under 420. Well, I mean the hard part is is that safe? actually I, I think if you you'd, right. you'd probably add in definitions, then you would also probably add. Uh, uh, It'd be in the operation section, so I suspect, that would talk about the vehicle. But yes, you you can. Uh, the the council had two specific uh, uh, definitions in in earlier ordinances on what's enclosed and what's unenclosed. Then, as well as material that you must use to be enclosed. Is there a requirement though anywhere in this document for a vehicle to be enclosed? I don't. <clears throat> I don't think so. There, you know, when we say this document, um, we had um, uh, BL, was it 2022 or 2021 911? And then we had 2022 1089. And they both had multiple amendments to them. So um, let me just check the final amendment to 1089 and see where we landed. I think they did, as Philly represented, take that definition yeah. out and leave it to the commission to decide. This is where and, I think. And there still is a. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. 67710 there's a definition of an enclosed vehicle but i didn't see a requirement i'm wondering if that was taken out if that's the latest version of that that's what i'm checking right now um okay i think i do have that up this is 1089 yeah this is 1089 mm -hmm. okay They've still got a definition. Um, so yeah, this is this is an updated version of enclosed vehicles that was updated by um, BL. Wait, no, it was it would be the amendment? It wasn't in that. It was in the amendment. Wait, wait, wait. Let me go back. Amendment was it amendment two? I think. Okay, sorry about that. I'm look, now looking at amendment two to BL twenty twenty two ten eighty nine. 
Yeah, it does delete the definition of enclosed vehicle, mm -hmm. deletes it from 677.010, and replaces it with enclosed vehicle means an enclo fully enclosed entertainment transportation vehicle. Unenclosed vehicle means an entertainment transportation vehicle that does not meet the definition of an enclosed vehicle. The MTLC shall determine what constitutes a fully enclosed entertainment transportation vehicle and shall develop rules and regulations to ensure that both enclosed vehicles and unenclosed vehicles are safe and in compliance with these with the existing noise ordinances. So that's the new language from so, Amendment 2 so that's that did pass. Giving us a defined term, mm -hmm. but relative to the other sections of 677. It's a defined term that incorporates within it the ability for you all to define the term in a regulation. <laughs> so we, we, can't, we could stipulate that any, that any uh, entertainment vehicle operating in the county could be required to be enclosed. Um, There's not already a requirement within the document. Let me look that at the operating to, provisions to, before I answer that. And, and my, my question really was are they all required to be enclosed today? Um, no. They're not. That's, that's the question I'm asking. Yeah. So we have a defined term of what an enclosed vehicle is. Well, right now we sort of don't because it sort of punts it to y'all. Uh -huh. It means a fully enclosed entertainment transportation vehicle. Enclosed vehicle means a fully enclosed transportation entertainment vehicle, right? Page one? Yes. Yeah, under the rules, yeah. I mean under the definition. Under the definition. 677, yes. <clears throat> Unenclosed. And then, if then you, it says the MTLC shall determine what constitutes a fully enclosed entertainment transportation vehicle and but, shall... And, and I guess, thank you. Uh, the other sections of 677 do not state that a vehicle must be enclosed. So it would be reasonable, theoretically, to say that to meet the noise ordinance, you either have to have no speakers or be enclosed. And if you're enclosed, you have to have a certain STC rating on your glass to keep noise from going out. I mean, there are things like that that could be perceived as very reasonable. Theoretically. That, I, I believe that would be within your rulemaking purview, yes. Mm -hmm. I think about some buses, uh, like Pioneer coaches that are awesome rock star tour buses. They roll down the street, and I don't really hear them blaring their music on the inside. Um, but the polycarbonate that has holes in it and buses with windows, the old school buses converted with windows open or trailers that are open air, I hear them. We all hear them. So we would have an ability. I guess that's my question. We, there is not a requirement today that vehicles are enclosed. We would have an ability to regulate that and require it. And that's something that you're thinking about relative to your recommendations to us. Clear. Yeah, it would have to be like rationally supportive, you know, not arbitrary and capricious. It would have to be justified totally. by factual evidence. There's not a great way, for example, for an unenclosed entertainment vehicle with speakers to roll down the street and not be clearly audible from 50 feet away. Theoretically. There there is there is some technology that's available from a speaker standpoint. Uh, again, the silent event, I'm absolutely convinced they can do that. I think also the size of the speakers, one of the folks actually said that they're removing speakers, they will be putting small speakers on the backs of seats, for instance, that's that cool. are that are very, uh, there are others that I know they have directional issues and uh, governing devices and have studied and brought, you know, again, I wasn't with them when they had uh, the uh, sound engineers present, but they said we had a sound engineer on here and this is what we decided to do. So, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I remain optimistic that there, there are ways mm -hmm. to, to operate. You know, whether you have them enclosed or unenclosed, again, that's a, the commission's gonna have to make decisions for, for good or bad based on the evidence that you've gathered, that you'll gather through the public hearing, any information that you ask us to gather for you, uh, and then the testimony delivered again on April the 28th. Mm -hmm. Teresa, when, if you look at um, 7710, um, and it says that we will determine what constitutes a fully enclosed entertainment vehicle and develop the rules and regulations to ensure that both enclosed and unenclosed are safe. So we couldn't just ban unenclosed. And in compliance with existing noise yeah, ordinances. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not necessarily saying a ban, but if we're, it's difficult to have speakers that are omnidirectional. Is that the right, right. word? 
instead of directional. Like I think about Pritzker Pavilion in Chicago. It's a beautiful amphitheater and pavilion that has speakers that all point in, so you don't hear it from a block away. You could, you could theoretically have a really advanced speaker system that points inward and you don't hear it. Generally, what we would, from a staff standpoint, what we would expect is whether it's open or it's closed, it's going to meet the requirements of 920. So it is incumbent on, you know, what technology we can provide that we would require, or it's incumbent on the operations. If they cannot operate within the sound ordinance, for good or bad, that's, that's an issue that I, I can't address. They have to be able to be in compliance of 920. Yeah, I mean, I think we would look to them to present evidence that they can pr provide systems that would accomplish that. And, and even we could have an inspector go to their place of business and stand 50 feet away and see if it's clearly audible before they are allowed to operate on the street, yeah, totally. theoretically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so right now it does say that they will certify that their own vehicles are compliant and that we will just do spot checks in terms of inspection, but, but yeah, I think we could still do that. Well, the same thought process is also under 677240. C about the consumption of beer, ale, wine, or other alcoholic beverages upon or within an entertainment transportation vehicle is strictly prohibited except to the extent otherwise permitted by the NTLC and Metropolitan Beer Board. I was about to ask the same question. The beer board regulations are also addressed in the two ordinances that I've talked about, um, uh, uh, BL 2020, I'm, I'm not sure if it's 2021 or 2022, not in 11, and BL 2022, um, 1089. And um, they also modified Title VII, Chapter 24 of the Metropolitan Code, which is the, the beer board ordinance. So, uh, Mr. Fields, is your office making recommendations to us as to how to regulate beer, alcohol, and wine? I look at my lawyer on that particular one. I mean, I, I think that Title VII is granted to the beer board and their inspectors to enforce. So, again, same answer I gave y'all on the noise ordinance. You know, if um, they were to find a violation, you know, and our regulations say that you have to comply with all applicable um, uh, ordinances and regulations and whatnot, um, then that could be a disciplinary matter if, if they were to violate it. And that would apply to the, whether it's the State Alcoholic Beverage Commission laws or uh, or the beer board. I mean, in other words, whatever is allowed under the law is what they could do, and that's all they could do. And we are we ha we ha we are in not daily contact with the beer board, but we have a, a working relationship with them to uh, uh, in partnership. Uh, as do the police, as we look at the entertainment district downtown, we have, it's called the Entertainment District Initiative, and we have multiple agencies of government working together to uh, 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 deal with issues that are, that uh, exist in the, in that particular area. Will we be getting information on the April 28th meeting about whether there is any exception by the Metropolitan Beer Board to this uh, uh, prohibition of beer, alcohol, or beer on the, on the, entertainment transportation vehicles? So I may be able to answer that, but hang on, I have to make sure I look at all the right amendments. Well, it, it can wait till the 28th when we have the okay. public yeah. hearing. Yes, <laughs> the, I'm just, I'm the just, answer is the beer, I will ask the executive yes, director I think that, of the beer board to be present. I think okay, there is a um, exception, but it is I, I wasn't complicated planning how they amended it. I was fact-finding uh, <laughs> hearing today, I just trying to spot some of the issues we might want to have some facts on. Well, I'll ask you to put, to, to put together some information. Uh, Benton will be happy to work with us. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? All right, well, I would like to thank everyone for uh, appearing today uh, for our meeting. Hopefully, uh, We've left a little more informed about what uh, we've been tasked to consider. Do we need to have a motion to adjourn? Sure. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.